Hello and welcome to the Guna Talk. Back again with you guys for another episode of the Arsenal News Show. Join you every morning at 8 a.m. UK time. Hope you're doing good. Hope you're doing well. Thank you, as always, for making this a part of your morning routines. Do drop a like on the video and subscribe to the channel if you are indeed new around here with those notifications turned on so you never miss a show. Good morning to those of you joining us live in the chat box. Uh, morning to Marcus. Uh, morning to Matt G, to Olu, good morning to Carl, good morning to Blackshine, Dave, Alpha, Damian, Morgie, uh, good morning to Kaiser, Gunner Dude, Lars, Martin, Sweating, Merlot, Louis, uh, we've got Steve, we've got Johnny, Rich, SJ Chan, uh, Stevie, Stephen, Mark, and plenty more, Peeny Ween, Jose, David, uh, and others too. Thank you so much, as always, guys, uh, for making us a part of your morning routines, and uh, yeah, Let's crack on with today's show. Uh, we start, unfortunately, with kind of a negative uh, beginning to the show in discussing yesterday's Premier League results, uh, which didn't necessarily go the way that Arsenal would have wanted them to. I kind of switched things off. I didn't watch the Man City game. I haven't even watched the highlights, to be honest, of it yet. I was out last night at the cinema. No spoilers, promise. Um, and... Uh, I just kind of switched my phone off and then just checked at the end to see what the score was and found myself completely unsurprised uh, at what uh, I saw uh, from West Ham United. Also rather frustrating uh, at the same time that West Ham decided to <laughs> just not use some of the players that they should use. Obviously no Declan Rice uh, in the team yesterday, no Zuma. Um, and they, they kind of started as Emerson playing as kind of a left wing back position Sarah Ben Rama playing from the bench um they didn't even have two extra subs uh either I don't know what the situation was I didn't really do enough digging to find out whether or not Declan Rice was was injured uh, or just didn't for some reason want to play in the game um but yeah really uh Really, really frustrating. Um, and uh, West Ham, I would, didn't have much hope, to be honest, that they would do us a favour, but uh, certainly they, uh, <laughs> well, they just didn't. Anyway, how that leaves the table, of course, is that Man City have now officially gone top. Uh, they are one point ahead of Arsenal now, having played a game less than the Gunners. That game less is away at Brighton, so we've got to hope that they do us a favour. Arsenal, as we've talked about, just need to focus on themselves. However, it is very difficult to not think that had we have got two extra points against any of Southampton, West Ham, Liverpool, um, then obviously we would still be top right now. Also, thinking back to that Brentford game and the refereeing mistake that also cost us two points in that one also. But uh, Liverpool getting a result in their game means they move up to uh, fifth uh, or further ahead in fifth place. Level on games played with Spurs on 59 points. Unlikely that they will get into the top four. Manchester United still four points ahead, having played two games left. And they will play Brighton tonight, of which I certainly have a lot of hope that Brighton will be able to do uh, us a favour in a sense of just annoying Manchester United supporters and getting as high up the table as they feasibly can. Brighton actually can move as high as sixth place, going above Tottenham and Aston Villa with a win. They've played three games less than both of those two sides as the Premier League comes towards a bit of a head this season. Now, an update on Gabriel Magalhaes' injury is, I'm glad to say, positive. Uh, my colleague Kaya Karnak reporting yesterday on our Arsenal Way view from the Clock End podcast that the expectation is that he will hopefully be available for the game at the weekend against Newcastle, that it was an ankle injury that was actually the issue and that in a collision with Aaron Ramsdale when Madueke scored was kind of the problem. But it's good to know that Gabriel's injury is not said to be as bad as, as what they first feared, uh, which is, is good news. And uh, I'm hoping that this uh, certainly turns out to be the case and that we see the Brazilian back and playing for Arsenal at the weekend. Otherwise, we would have had to go through that. Oh, what are we going to have to play holding and Kivior together? And instead, maybe we can continue with the same centre-back pairing that we saw tackle Chelsea on Tuesday night. So certainly uh, very, very happy indeed uh, to see positive news regarding the centre-half. Uh, now, Sammy Mottbell of the Daily Mail has been uh, reporting a number of Arsenal-related transfer stories, both regarding incomings and outgoings. Beginning with the outgoings, Reese Nelson has supposedly rejected a contract offer from Arsenal. Uh, we heard from Nelson in the kind of the winter break, if you remember that, when we had the uh, uh, the trip to the Middle East to play Lyon and AC Milan, and we played Juventus back at the Emirates. Well. 
During those games, uh, Reese Nelson faced the press and actually spoke about his keenness to re-sign with Arsenal and to extend his stay with the club. And after he scored that goal against Bournemouth, it sparked news of potential contract talks going on between the club and the player. However, it seems to be that that mindset of Nelson has changed. Now, whether that's changed because he felt that the offer from Arsenal was not good enough or the amount of time that it's taken for Arsenal to actually get into gear and offer him a new contract, whether that's changed his mind, but his mind has changed and players' minds do change and they're allowed to change. But it seems as though that Reese Nelson will not uh, be an Arsenal player next season. And as we are completely aware of at the moment in time, that Brighton look to be the key side that are trying to... Uh, get the player away from the club and we'll be looking to sign him on a free. Now, I'm fairly confident that there is things in place that mean if a if an English club lose a player on a free and he moves to another English club, I think there is compensation clauses that kick into gear. I don't know if that will happen in this case, but I'm pretty sure that's happened in, in previous deals that have seen players move on a free, in quotation marks, um, between English clubs. But I don't think it'll be anything close to what he's probably valued at at this stage. But... That means that Arsenal will be down a wide player. And uh, again, according to Sammy, um, Moussa Diaby uh, is said to be a primary target of the club for that forward area. Now, they were said to have interest in the player in January when they missed out on Mihailo Mudrik. However, they ended up moving for Leandro Trossard, as we said. But we've known for some time that Arsenal have wanted to bring in a player that would be a competitor, not only to that left-hand side, but also to the right-hand side. And Moussa Diaby fulfills that with a left-footed wide player, playing for Bayer Leverkusen, 14 goals and 10 assists in 14, uh, 42 games this season, nine goals and eight assists in 29 Bundesliga appearances for Bayer Leverkusen. Now, Leverkusen are said to want a significant figure for Diaby. We're looking upwards of £70 million probably to try and bring in a player that would be a competitor rather than an immediate starter. But I suppose that is the level of money that it takes to bring in players that are going to be starting at the same level as someone like Bakaya Saka. You think about Man City having a front three with with Foden and Sergio Aguero and Mares, and they spend a hundred million to bring in Jack Grealish to compete with with Foden and, and push him out of the team. In fact, so Arsenal have got to be moving along those same lines and spending those same kind of figures if we want to be in a position where we're competing with Man City to try and bring in a squad that is competitive across all fronts. And Musa Diaby would certainly fulfil that role. And his versatility to be able to play in both wing positions and even with scope to play at centre-forward adds that level of versatility to his game as well. Now, uh, the, the, the report continues to suggest that, of course, as we've known and I've reported with you guys as well, is that Declan Rice is the primary target of the club, but that Romeo Lavia is seen as an alternative uh, to Declan Rice if indeed Arsenal are unable to get their hands on Declan Rice. You probably saw um, the, the news yesterday regard, regarding Drew Bellingham and Real Madrid closing, according to Fabrizio Romano, on the England International. Now, that is going to create some competition, of course, in central midfield. Uh, there's going to be a lot of teams looking for central midfield and a lot of teams that really appreciated uh, Drew Bellingham. And that means that they may instead now be looking at someone like Rice, whether that's Man United, whether that's Manchester City, we'll have to wait and see. But Arsenal have got contingency plans in place in case they aren't able to get their primary targets. However, there is said to be, uh, there is said to have been a confidence around Arsenal for some time that they would get Rice um, and that they've put a lot of work into this transfer already. And a lot of work has been going on behind the scenes regarding the Rice deal uh, and that hopefully a deal can be done in the summer. It's one that we'll have to wait and see and see if it turns anything into anything considerate. Um, considerable, rather. Uh, Wilfred Zaha, though, is said to be the alternative should Arsenal fail to get the wingers that they want, the same as Lavia is for Rice, um, and available a free. It's interesting that a free transfer is what the alternative is because you'd imagine that Zaha is going to get snapped up pretty quickly during the summer transfer window because he's available on a free. That means that if Arsenal aren't able to get Moussa Diaby, that decision needs to come to the fore pretty early on uh, in discussions. You can't be kind of going back and forth in negotiations with Moussa Diaby and then come late July, realise you can't get him and then go for a, a free transfer in Zaha. You'd imagine that Zaha's going to be snapped up pretty quickly in June. So 
that's certainly one that Arsenal need to be swift on. I think Arsenal are planning on being swift, as swift as they can be. Get players in early, get them into the team in pre-season, get them training, get them adjusting, get them involved in those pre-season tours and uh, involved with the team as soon as possible. But Wilfred Zaha uh, is said to be an alternative. Now, don't choose an alternative when it comes to choosing your VPN. Choose your primary and number one target. And that number one target should be NordVPN, which provide a fantastic VPN service, of course, to you and yours. And you can get a significant discount off a one or two year plan by going to nordvpn.com slash guna. And you can go and get a subscription uh, with the help of TGT and the sponsorship of NordVPN, which gives you the ability to, of course, change your geolocation, move from one place to another, theoretically, digitally, with, of course, your tablet, phone or laptop. It also gives you great security online, keeps you safe, keeps you away from those peeping Toms too. So certainly worth investing in. If you want to get yourself a VPN service, don't settle for the alternative. Get the primary number one target, of which that, of course, is NordVPN. And the prize continues to go in football prizes. The early bird prize, I can unfortunately tell you, has unfortunately run out at this stage. It's three ninety five a ticket. And there are 85 tickets left in the competition to win a signed Netherlands home shirt, signed and numbered and named by Dennis Bergkamp as well. So you can win a signed and framed home Arsenal shirt. Dennis Bergkamp has also signed just by entering the competition. It enters you into a separate competition as well as plenty of Arsenal retro merch and some football prizes site credit as well. Right, let's go to part two and your questions right after this. Now, the fantastic community at TGT, of course, last month raised over, well, actually exactly £1,500, which we donated to the Arsenal Visions and Arsecast's uh, Arsenal Foundation fundraiser. And uh, we'll be making our donation in the next uh, when the next quarter comes round regarding uh, our support to Macmillan Cancer Support as well. But you can still get your hands on caps, which will then be uh, any profits that we make from these caps are split in half and sent to Macmillan Cancer Support and the Arsenal Foundation throughout and into the future. So do make sure you get involved and uh, we certainly will be looking forward to uh, adding more. I've got uh, a fundraiser, fingers crossed, to talk to you about coming up towards July, which I'm looking forward to getting involved with, which I will, as I say, as soon as I get more details and it's all confirmed, I will be launching and speaking with you about as soon as feasibly possible. Okay, chat box. Let's jump in there. Let's take some of these questions. I'm not going to use the Q&A tab on youtube i don't think it really changed all that much to be honest uh so i think i'm just going to go into the chat box and see um what you guys are going on about uh, abby says uh what are your feelings and thoughts about the rumors of selling Xhaka and smith row in the summer uh, not good abby uh not good at all i don't think that Xhaka is a player that should be sold this summer. I think we should be looking to upgrade on Xhaka. I don't think we should be looking to replace. I think we often get kind of obsessed with this term replaced. We don't necessarily need to replace existing solid options in the squad. What we need to do is make sure that we are upgrading upon them, bringing in competitors in order to have the best possible option so that if that replacement that you've brought in gets injured, well, you've sold the guy that he replaced, so you then have to bring in a backup option. No, you need to bring in a player that's as good as, if not better, the existing option in the squad, keep the existing option, move the player on from the squad, and if they get, you know, sorry, move the player into the position in the squad if the other player gets injured, and that's the way forwards. That's how you manage the squad in the best possible way um marcus says can chelsea finally win a match against city please let me dream i would not suggest getting your hopes up i mean man city's fixtures coming up now are leeds united who to be fair have a manager that is said to be as good as arteta pep klopp anyone in the business sam allardyce as he says himself is is as good in terms of his knowledge in terms of his prowess in terms of his football integrity, no, definitely not that. Um, as the man, I mean, have you ever seen more hubris uh, than when that conversation went down in the press conference? Hilarious, hilarious, like absolute hilarity. After Leeds, they play Real Madrid in their first leg away in the Bernabeu. 
um, in the Champions League. They then travel away to Everton the following Sunday before playing Man City, uh, before playing Real Madrid again. And then they have Chelsea just four days later in the Premier League before they then travel to Brighton three days after that. And then they have the last Premier League game of the season, which is, of course, against Brentford away from home. Arsenal just need to do what they need to do, which is to keep winning. If we drop any points, I think it's over. I think we have to beat Newcastle. We then have to beat Brighton. We then have to beat Forest, and we have to beat Wolves. We have to win the next four games to have any hope at all of winning the title. If we drop points at any point this season now, I think it is utterly and entirely lost, but it is all in City's hands, and we've just got to hope that they can drop points at some stage during this season. Uh, Nathaniel, you're very welcome. I appreciate the comb. Uh, thanks for the video. Uh, Fahim says, is bringing in Lavia and Rice a possibility? I don't see us getting Caicedo as his price is probably higher than it would have been in January. I think I'd like to see Arsenal go out and sign two central midfielders. That's what I would like Arsenal to go out and do. Now, there is obviously a, an argument that the left eight role could be fulfilled by a more offensive-minded midfielder and that Arsenal might transition to a Bernardo Silva-esque option in that role. Of course, KDB plays in the Erdegaard position in the 4-3-3. Well, kind of 4-3-3. It's a strange formation for C. But on paper, the 4-3-3 that sees KDB play in the Erdegaard role, they tend to play either Gundogan or Silva in that left-sided eight role. Now, Gundogan's more of the box-to-box, offers a lot going forwards, but offers stuff also in the other direction as well, offers control. That's kind of our Xhaka, in a sense. We need to look at the Bernardo Silva-type option that they can play in that position to give them extra fluidity and forward motion. Now, I think that could be Smith-Rowe. Vieira has obviously played that position. But there is an interest in Mason Mount, it seems, as well, and he could be someone that Arsenal move to kind of look at maybe bringing into that position. Potentially, Leandro Trossard could play that role as well. Certainly something I would like to see played there in the future. Um, Matt G says, regarding Rice, what does a lot of work going on behind the scenes actually mean? Does that mean contacting the player to find out his interest, discussing wage demands? Yeah, I mean, the if you think about the Gabriel Jesus deal, for instance... Gabriel Jesus was a player that Arsenal had made contacts with, had made inquiries about all the way back in the November before, as far as I am aware, the November before we actually signed him. So you're talking before the January window, you're talking before the Dusan Vlaovic situation, you know, all of that stuff, there were talks going on, you're you're kind of putting the feelers out, you're talking with agents, you're talking with intermediaries, you're doing things, third parties, you know, they're trying to find out and gauge how much things might cost, how willing the player might be to come to the club. There's, you know, discussions going on, unofficial discussions going on, if you like. Um, things are being, you know, talks are being had. That's why you see deals done before the window even opens. You look at Real Madrid right now, are reportedly very close to agreeing personal terms with Jude Bellingham. You know, that's kind of what we're talking about here. And, and personal terms can be agreed well ahead of a transfer window being open. And deals can be done. You think about Cody Gakpo, agreed a deal, Liverpool and PSV agreeing a deal before the January window actually opened. So, yes, work can go on behind the scenes, both talking with the club, with the player, intermediaries, stuff goes on. Uh, Chris, hey, Tom, will Real Madrid be getting Jude? And do you think uh, we'll push for someone like Camavinga or Aurelian Chouameni? No, I think Real Madrid will look to have those three as all options for central midfield. Camavinga has actually been playing in a left-back role uh, at Real Madrid as well. They will want to keep all three of those players and have a very young, exciting group of central midfielders to keep them kind of rolling and, and moving into the future. They've had Cruz and they had Casemiro and they've had Modric for a long time at the time and they're looking to kind of build the next decade of central midfielders and those three certainly fit that bill. Um, Tuan says, hey Tom, what do you think is a reasonable price tag for Declan Rice and how much maximum can we spend on him? Maximums I'm not as keen on looking at anymore. You know, maximum figures for a team that want to compete for the title. It's difficult to kind of get your head around how much you'd maximum pay for a club. And if your team goes out and spends whatever they need to go get the player in, I rarely turn around now and I'm like, well, we shouldn't have done that. Like, I just kind of want to see the players brought in if they're good enough. But I think that a figure that's reasonable for Declan Rice is around the £70 million price tag. I think that's what Arsenal should be looking to try and get a deal done at. Some suggest it might take triple figures in terms of millions to get Declan Rice through the door. I'm hopeful that that's not going to be the case and that we might be able to get him for significantly below that £100 million suggestion. So I feel a £70 million is a reasonable price tag 
for Declan Rice. Um, James, is it if Arsenal let Enketia, Smith Rowe, and Reese leave this summer, is that a success or a failure of the Hellend Academy? It depends. I mean, if you're looking at getting good money for those players, then you'd look at it as a success. But at the same time, you want to try and keep your best players. And Reese, you know, Reese moving on, I don't think is necessarily a, a scalp on Arsenal's recruitment. What I do think it is a bit of a a downside on is obviously that he's gone on a free and that we weren't able to move him on at a time where we could have got some money in for him. So that, I think, is a bit of a profile of a, unfortunately, a bit of a failure on Arsenal's part. Eddie and Ketty, you know, I think you should be able to get a good fee for him. And Smith Rowe as well, if he was to move on, which I don't necessarily want to see happen, um, if you were able to move either of those two on to significant money, that's always going to be looked at as a success on, on Arsenal's part. Think about Awobi, you know, Arsenal getting 35-odd million quid for him. Think about um, Joe Willock and Arsenal getting £25 million for him. That's £60 million quid on two players that have come through the academy. That's a really good sign of success. Arsenal's academy has produced some brilliant players, some great assets. Arsenal have made some good money from players that have moved on from the academy. And that's always going to be part of you know what an academy at a Premier League club is, is also it's going to be something that's going to create financial uh, backing and to, to create reinvestment into the first team for the future. Um, Salah Houdin says, uh, is Zaha's age and injury issues a good upgrade or competitor? Agent Sam can do it. Um, I think that Zaha as an alternative is like the Jorginho deal in January. You're looking at probably bringing him in on a two year deal in the summer. And only if you can't get kind of those primary targets that are younger options that are investments for the future. That's what you're looking at regarding the Zaha deal. It's, it's not, I'm not saying like in terms of quality, he's the same as a winger as Jorginho is as a midfielder. And I rate Jorginho, trust me. But Zaha, I think, is kind of the Jorginho esque option for the wide areas if Arsenal aren't able to get their primary targets. And let's be honest, we want to see Arsenal getting our primary targets because we're trying to go for a really high position in the league again next season. And to do that, you can't allow teams like Man United and Chelsea and Liverpool, who have finished lower than you, beat you to those targets. If it's Man City beating you to a target, I can understand that. If it's Newcastle or United, Liverpool or Chelsea, we shouldn't be allowing those teams where we are in the table now getting in ahead of us unless they're offering absolutely ridiculous wages that we can't compete with. But we should be being able to offer significant capital to those players as well. So um, that's kind of where my head's at with that one, Salahuddin. I hope that answers your question. Uh, Matthew says, Tom, will Chelsea be having a massive sell-off this summer? And if so, are there any players that we should be looking at? Yes, they have to. They have to move players on. They have to start making some money on player sales. In terms of players that I would like to, to, to look at, um, it's it's tricky, you know. Mason Mount, I have an appreciation for, and I know there's a lot of people in this chat box and who watch this channel that could not be further away from that opinion of wanting Mount, and that's fine. You know, everyone's entitled to their opinion. I think that Mason Mount would be a really interesting addition to the squad, Champions League winner, you know, and someone that played in a Champions League final and, and helped to win that competition. Has got loads of Premier League experience, England international. Um, could also be something that helps in the Declan Rice chemistry and that kind of dynamic as well, I think would fit into things perfectly at Arsenal. Um, and may surprise people actually with what he's capable of. But beyond him, I mean, players that they signed this summer just gone and the, the winter window just gone, I don't see moving on. Otherwise, you know, Madueke, I think, is a really exciting young player. I think that Enzo is obviously a very talented player, but nowhere near what they paid for. And Mudrik is obviously a very talented player, but you don't, I'd only take him for like the £40 million mark, I think, in the summer. And I don't see Chelsea doing that, to be honest, either. So it's difficult. So no, I don't think so. I don't think there's anyone that I'd be looking to, to bring in from Chelsea other than a couple that I've already mentioned. Um, Wes Bird says, if we want to be taken seriously and be competitive in the Premier League and Champions League next season, then we have to be aiming higher than someone like Zaha in my humble but accurate. <laughs> it's, not so hum it's not so humble if you say your opinion's accurate. <laughs> and I think that cancels out the humble nature. Uh, you're, you're bleeding into hubris there. Um, but I do agree. I do think that we should be looking to try and go for a player better than in terms of a profile, a younger profile as well, 
than Zaha with the ambitions that we've got for next season. I see Zaha being like an Aston Villa style signing. Like I can see Aston, and ironically, that's who Emery has always wanted. So maybe we see Zaha end up at Aston Villa next season. Uh, we'll have to wait and see. Maybe Brighton. Who knows? Uh, depends what Aston Villa meet him. Um, let's go to um, Lewis says, Tom, have you ever considered doing a vlog type video on game days? I love your videos, by the way. Thank you, Lewis. That's very kind of you. The answer is yes, I absolutely have. The, the, the problem with that is that you have to understand that at the end of the day, I'm working for a company. I work with Football London. And there is obviously, in my mind, a bit of a clash if I start doing vlogs on match days. I'm not going to the games as a representative as the Guna Talk. You know, I'm going to the games as a representative of Football London. And if I'm doing work outside of my job, and I, I don't think that's the, the most professional thing you know, in the world. I don't. I think it's fine to record like a little video after a game like, you know, James does, even though he works for The Athletic or like Harry does, even though he's doing work for BBC Radio London. You know, I don't think there's anything wrong with doing like the odd clip or video there. But if I start doing a vlog, which would kind of entail an entire day's worth of filming, you know, I think there's clashes there. I would need to get, you know, certainly permission, I think, from my workplace. There's also a lot of work that goes into vlogs in terms of editing. Football edit, uh, video editing is something that I really would love to learn to do. I've talked about that a lot on the channel, but it's always been time to be able to learn to do it. If there was like, I'd love to do like a course in video editing or stuff like that when I had like time to be able to commit to learning how to use Adobe Premiere Pro, I think it is, stuff like that. You know, I'd love to to learn how to video edit and do some more stuff and do more vlog stuff, you know. Um, outside of work, I'd love to do more vlog videos. I'd love to do more pre-recorded videos, edited videos. But it's something that I need to learn and invest some time and money into to learn how to do. Um, so and if anyone's got any tips, I don't be, I, and that's not me saying I'm looking for freelancers, you know, that would edit, edit for me. I want to learn myself. So if anyone's got any tips or anything like that, do get in touch. I'd love to be better in that field. I feel like, you know, so we're getting to a stage where the channel is an amazing community and a, and a big one at that. And I should be better at learning these things and being able to do these things, I feel, at this stage. Um, scrolling down in the chat box, um, Rich says, how much do you think Smith Rowe is worth? It would be funny if he cost less than either Willock or Wobi, although the market has changed since they were sold. Yeah, the, the, the market's changed. His stature in the squad has changed. Wobi was a starter when we sold him. Um, Willock was getting lots of minutes as well uh, before we sold him. Um, but Smith Rowe, you know, you'd have to say he's worth upwards of £40 million because we've, we've invested a brand new contract into him, I think, what was last summer. Uh, sorry, the summer before last in 2021, he signed that new deal. So was it 2021? I'm sure it was that he signed the new deal because we had the... I'm trying to think that the, the seasons have blended together so much. It feels so much has happened in such a short space of time. I think it was, I think it was the summer before last he signed that deal. I think he's got something like three years left on his contract. Let me have a quick look. I know you're frantically all typing it into the chat box. And when I scroll down, I'm going to see it. So his contract runs out in 2026. He signed in 2021. It was the summer before last year. So you've got to think he's worth, you know, easily upwards of 40 million pounds. But I, I don't think Arsenal are going to sell him. I would be surprised. They'd have to get a significant amount of money uh, in there. AFC Cape Town says more English bias. I want to put this out there. I get really frustrated with this line um, a lot. I get accused sometimes of, of English bias. I don't know whether it's because I'm English myself, but trust me, there is no bias from my perspective. I'm looking at players from my own perspective, from my own analysis of the players that we get linked to, from my own watching of those players. And that's where my opinion forms. You know, I like Declan Rice. I like Mason Mount. And it is just coincidental that both players have to be English in this sense. So I would encourage people to not buy into this, what I would describe as just frankly BS, that there is a bias towards English players from myself because there's been a lot of players that Arsenal have been linked to in the past that have been English that I've not wanted Arsenal to go and sign. So from my perspective, here is me telling you that I don't have that bias towards English players. I just have my own appreciation towards specific players regardless of of what their nationality is. Is there a benefit to signing an English player in this league? Yes, but only in the sense of it being a homegrown player and obviously the communication factor as well. But when I'm looking at a player, I'm looking at a player because of what the player is. Their technical ability, their ability as a footballer, where they fit into the team, their style, how I think they would mesh with the current group. All of those things I'm looking at for me 
it's not an English bias why I'm personally looking at that player, nothing to do with their nationality. The only time I would ever factor in a player's nationality, and even then, it's not the nationality, it's about the communication, the language barriers, how easily have they transitioned into other teams, how easily would they be able to transition into this team. And that's only because previously we've had Unai Emery, whose communication, of course, was an issue. And I think that that was one of the big things that, Kind of think restricted him as a coach at Arsenal, and since then he's learned English better. He's now gone to Aston Villa, and you know he's he's developed as a coach, and I think he's doing a great job over there, and it's the right place for him. But you know, I think that's the only time where I would ever have maybe, and even maybe then not. I mean, Gabriel, for instance, is is still learning English, and his English is being perfected. It's not perfect yet, and when he does interviews, sometimes it's it's still a bit broken, as you would expect. But he's learning, and he's done fantastically well. So. Yeah, maybe even then it doesn't come into things. I'm just looking at players based upon who they are as a footballer. Um, let's go to Aditya says, Tom, any inputs on Elneny? Do we see him playing for us next season? Also, he would have made a big difference for us instead of holding. Uh, I don't think in, case, in the case of holding, it doesn't make too much of a difference. Um, but will he have an input on next season? Maybe in some of the cup competitions. We're offering him an extension. He doesn't. It doesn't affect things. It doesn't change things for us. It doesn't block anyone from being signed. Arsenal are going to do their business regardless of whether or not El Nenny is at the club. He signed a brand new deal for next season. It's the right thing to do. Um, I, I think it really takes a heartless character to turn around and say that, you know, we shouldn't be doing this. We shouldn't be offering him a new deal. It's something classy that cl the club have done. I think it's a classy move. I don't think it affects anything regarding you know, the club's capacity to bring players in or fill the squad out with other, um, you know, aspects. That's that's kind of it for me. Um, so, yeah. No, Elneny, he might get a few minutes here and there, but I think it's his presence that's most important. He's doing his coaching badges as well. You never know. You may see him pop up in the coaching team in the future, but uh, I've got no information on that. I just know he's doing his coaching badges. So is uh, Xhaka. So has been Cedric. So, who knows? We'll wait and see. Uh, Louis says, El Nenny has made his own academy. He's making his exit plans already. The club just did a classy contract to help him recover and retire at the club. So there you go. Uh, Cass says, do you think Vieira will come good next season? As I think this season has been tough for him. Or do you think he could go the same way as Lokonga? Um, I think that I hope that he can. You know, I really hope that he's going to turn things around. I think that there's been struggles this season because of a lack of game time. But there have also been opportunities that I feel he's not taken well enough when given to him. He does, I think, need to... The transition to the league does need to happen a lot more, but he's not playing enough minutes to in the same way to transition. Obviously, training with the Arsenal team gives you so much, but you need to play to get that ultimate level of experience is a loan the right way forwards for next season? Maybe. But then what do you do at the end of that loan if you've brought, say, somebody in like a like a Mason Mount? You know, what do you do then? You're going to have to sell him on anyway. So it's difficult. Um, what I would say is that it's very frustrating when on social media, it's, it's very similar to kind of the Arteta situation where if you say anything regarding a player, you know, you get jumped on by people that are either Vieira in or Vieira. I can't believe we're getting into this dynamic again now. Like I put a tweet out the other day saying... Um, about Charlie Patino, I think it was related to Charlie Patino and the fact I, that people were talking about Vieira being bought and how maybe if we hadn't bought Vieira, there would be space in the squad for um, for Vieira. I tweeted saying Fabio Vieira has nothing to do with the Charlie Patino situation, and I don't think that it does. He'll find the exit door if he doesn't improve. We're a different club now. And like I was set upon in some cases, like this person replied to me saying, if he doesn't improve in kind of quotation marks, after a whopping amount of three Premier League games, give your head a wobble. <laughs> you know, to which I'm like, I'm, I am I myself have been one of Vieira's biggest backers. You guys know, listen to this, I've backed Vieira. I've really supported Vieira. I've wanted to see more of him. I wanted to give him time and the benefit of the doubt. And whilst the reality might be that he's not played enough minutes, the only way that he plays more is by proving to Arteta and proving into those small opportunities that he's getting that he's good enough to play. And it's as simple as that. You know, he has to prove to Arteta, prove to the club that he's good enough to get those minutes. And then when they come, he has to be able to be good enough to prove he's worth playing again. And so far, he's not necessarily done that enough in the opportunities that he has been given. You know, the Brentford game looked good. The Wolves game looked OK. The game against Southampton, not good. Games in the Europa League, hit and miss. Cup games, hit and miss. So it's difficult to really look at Vieira and think, yeah, he is one for the future. 
it's difficult to know the answer to that right now. Um, anyway, we're going to wrap things up there. Uh, thank you so much, guys, for tuning in and listening. I really appreciate uh, all that you guys do in terms of the support you bring to the channel. I do want to point you in the direction of DG, Deluda Guna, who I'm going to be joining at nine. So in 25 minutes or so, I'm going to be jumping on with DG to have a chat uh, about the Arsenal. So do listen to both of us over there. I look forward to that. Always a pleasure to talk to and join DG in any of his shows. Uh, so yeah, that's going to be hopefully a lot of fun. Um, but do drop a like on the video here. Do subscribe to the channel here uh, as well. And I'll be back tomorrow morning uh, with another 8am show to bring you all the updates. Uh, we may have a show a little bit later on today as well. We'll have to wait and see. But uh, yes, lots to come on the channel. Lots more Arsenal news to be discussed. Lots more questions to be answered. Have a fantastic Thursday. Enjoy yourselves. I'll speak to you soon. And as always, up the Arsenal. <laughs>